Good evening, everybody. My name is John Hubbard, Jr. I'm Vice President of the Geologist in Jackson Hole. Before I go any further, shut these off if you wouldn't please or put it on vibrate so that we don't have one of these go off in the middle of uh, Darren's uh, presentation, if you would. We're very fortunate to have Darren Larson here back with us, actually. He was here two years ago. And this is going to be a follow-up, actually, on the presentation he made about the work he's doing along the foot of the Tetons here. Uh, Darren is currently assistant professor at Occidental College. When he was here, here two years ago, he hadn't quite gotten there, yet he was on his way. He has a bachelor's in geological and biological sciences from Colby College, Rockville, uh, Maine. Um, MS in Civil, Environmental, and Architectural Engineering, University of Colorado Boulder, PhD from University of Colorado Boulder and University of Iceland, and he did postdoc work at the University of Pittsburgh. A uh, wide variety of research interests is quaternary geology, paleoclimatology, sedimentary systems, hydroclimate, um, surface processes, glacial, glacial geology, human landscape interactions, and more. Long list of publications to his credit. Uh, and he currently is, uh, has a course load. Uh, he's teaching introductory geology, Earth's climate, past and future, <coughs> the evolution of Earth, no less. So there's only 4.6 billion years worth of uh, <laughs> matter. Field geology, great stuff, and sedimentary geology. And he has uh, worked uh, on his research widely through Western US, Iceland, Canada, Greenland, New Zealand. So without further ado, if you would join me in welcoming Darren Larson. Thanks a lot, John. Can everyone hear me pretty well? Yeah. Uh, no. Great. Right. No. Well, yeah, thank you for that kind of introduction. It's a pleasure to be here once again. Uh, perhaps some of you were here about two years ago when I gave a similar talk. And so um, I'm excited to present some of the new uh, and I'm going to results coming out of this project. Um, I noticed this while I was talking, the screen seemed to go out. I'm wondering if that's just because I haven't screwed in that VGA connection. If I maybe it's not hanging off there. Need it taped on or something? Oh, don't touch it. <laughs> you know All right. Um, so I'll be presenting work on the. Um, Glacial and uh, predominantly tectonic history of the, the Teton Range here uh, since deglaciation of the range. So, the relatively recent history for the last 15,000 years in Grand Teton National Park. <coughs> well, I'll be presenting this work here to you today. This is really. Uh, <coughs> we can take the. Exciting. 
and I like to be outside, and so I was really yearning for an opportunity to start maybe a side project that involved more field work of some kind. And I had lived and worked here in Jackson before, was very interested in the Teton outrage, and began thinking of ways I could apply some of the skills I've learned along the path of my PhD um, to a more proximal field site, one that I could visit more frequently. And so that project was uh, funded by seed grants through the National Park Service and the University of Wyoming. And that uh, is, is essentially what I'll be presenting today. That project has expanded greatly and now is funded by the National Science Foundation, the National Geographic Society, the Explorers Club, and so on. So I would like to thank my funding sources. <coughs> so I'd also like to introduce myself. On a personal note, I'm not a local of Jack. I'm from uh, the East Coast. I grew up uh, in New York State. Hudson Highlands. Uh, I went to college in Maine, and then after college, I moved out here uh, and uh, pursued a career as an environmental educator with the Teton Science Schools. Um, but was really drawn out here by the mountain range, uh, by the Tetons in this special place. I think everyone in this room would agree that the Tetons are very special. Why that is is perhaps personal to them, and we'll, hopefully today I'll be um, presenting results demonstrating why it's special from a geomorphological uh, or geological perspective. So before I get going, actually, uh, and, and kind of to, to keep things casual, um, I was wondering if I could ask the audience, how many folks here are local to Jackson Hole? So a good many of us are local. And how about those folks with their hands up? How many are actually more here in the area? All right, so not too many of us um, are from Jackson, but many of us now reside here. That was, that's kind of my personal history. My academic or professional life now as a uh, professor um, <clears throat> really goes as this. I'm a, as John mentioned, I'm a quaternary <coughs> geologist. I spend much of my time thinking about geologic processes that have occurred over the last two and a half million years, or this relatively recent time in the past, during which time we've experienced periodic glacial <coughs> and interglacial episodes. Uh, because it's been relatively recent, there's a lot of evidence on Earth's surface uh, relating to these changes in surface conditions, and a lot of that evidence is in the form of sediments, uh, or dirt, or mud. And much of what I do involves uh, targeting sediments in, in various locations to, to try and reconstruct changes that have happened with respect to Earth's climate system, glacier geology, or surface processes. <coughs> Uh, I use a range of methods, tools, and observations contained in data sets, uh, uh, and also spend time both in the field and in the lab to address questions in this, in this highly multidisciplinary field, bridging uh, fields from biology and geochemistry to, to strict geology or geophysics. So these are some of the places that I've worked. I'm very much a field geologist. Uh, these ninja stars here are all different locations that I've been able to visit or have ongoing research projects. Uh, there's sort of commonality in theme between each of these locations. Many of them um, uh, involve some aspect of climate reconstructions, whether that's moisture balance, glacier fluctuations, vegetation shifts, or environmental change, or surface processes. And these are those related to uh, perhaps landslides uh, uh, or tectonic events, which is what I'll be talking about. This afternoon. So we'll be focusing here in the Western US, and I'll be very much uh, focusing on this, this concept of paleoseismicity, or a, the, the past history of seismic activity here in the Tetons. So to place, oh, and I'm going to inter, uh, interrupt myself. If anyone has questions, because we're, this is such a small room, uh, the screens are so close, and I feel like it's fairly intimate. If you have questions uh, at any time, I encourage you to, to raise your hand or just blurt them out if I'm going too fast. Or if I advance the slide um, and you weren't finished reading, just, just let me know. Um, I'm very accustomed to students now just doing that very thing, so uh, don't, don't uh, hold back. So to place this talk within a greater context, uh, I have a few bullets, uh, bullet points up here. So I'm going to posit that climate and tectonic processes influence the geomorphic development of mountain landscapes over various time scales. These landscapes, and particularly alpine ecosystems, are sensitive to external disturbances related to climate changes, tectonic activity, and of course, human affairs, the human activity. The impacts of these disturbances pose serious challenges for human adaptation, 
hazard assessments and resource conservation efforts. So that, that couldn't hold more true um, in a region, or more true uh, here in, in the town of Jackson, just south of these two uh, national parks, heavily visited national parks. So the Teton Range presents, I, I feel, presents an exceptional opportunity um, because it has this very active tectonic setting, tectonic history, a very distinctive geomorphology. The shape of these mountain ranges uh, is very unique, and it occupies a sensitive position with respect to the climate dynamics of the western U.S. And additionally, the national park here uh, contains a, a relatively pristine and intact ecosystem that's been minimally impacted by uh, modern human activity. So it's a great place to work. <clears throat> However, despite um, a long history of scientific investigations in this region, and here I just compiled a, a list that's also probably not comprehensive, uh, uh, previous studies that have, that have investigated the tectonic, geomorphologic, glacier, geologic, or ecologic components of the mountain range, um, questions remain regarding the post-glacial climate and tectonic history of the Tetons. Some of you might be familiar with these researchers. They're, they uh, clearly are, are visiting this region often. Perhaps you know them um, or have a question with their work. Some of them, no doubt, have uh, presented here at the Geologist in Jackson Hall, for sure. Okay. So the goal of this project is to use lake sediments um, and lake sediment archives to quantify the influence of climate-driven changes and disturbances uh, and tectonic-driven disturbances. Um, these can are wide and varying. Climate disturbances can, can be uh, temperature shifts, changes in moisture balance or the hydrologic cycle here, fire occurrence, of course that's related to both of those components, or glacier fluctuations, and, and others. This, you could add more to this list. I'm, interested in tech, I'm also interested in tectonic uh, disturbances, and those are related to earthquakes or earthquake-generated disturbances, such as landslides, and how that has influenced the geomorphic development and evolution of the Tetons. So this, is, uh, this would be too much to cover in a single talk here. So um, I've, I've split it up into, into two bullets here. This is um, has been summarized in a, in a relatively recent paper that we put out uh, in the Journal of Quaternary Science Reviews, uh, which you can look up if you're interested, or I can send you a copy. Uh, but what I'll be focusing on today is uh, our tectonic-driven disturbances here uh, along the Teton Range. <clears throat> So where are the Tetons? Where are we? Here's a Landsat satellite image, uh, an oblique satellite image of the Teton range. For many of you, this is uh, probably uh, very familiar. You can uh, immediately uh, georeference yourself here. But for others, we're looking at the east face of the Teton range. The view here is to the southwest. So this is the valley of Jackson Hole, and this is uh, the Teton Valley up on the west side of the range in Idaho. <clears throat> the Teton Mountain Range here, uh, is a roughly north-south trending mountain range uh, that's uh, roughly 70 kilometers long by maybe 15 or 20 kilometers wide. It's flanked on both sides by these broad, uh, low-lying sedimentary basins and uh, contains a relatively resistant crystalline core that's uh, draped by relatively soft sedimentary units that are tilted to, to Idaho, to the western side. Many of you are familiar with these lake basins here. This is Jackson Lake and Lee Lake, Jenny Lake, and so on down uh, the range front. The ski resort is somewhere uh, down along here, Teton Village. <coughs> we'll be talking about these lakes uh, quite a bit in this, uh, in this presentation, but I also want to highlight, because I think this is a great image of the Tetons here, this series of roughly parallel, uh, very dramatic U-shaped valleys that uh, transect the range. So for example, this is Cascade Canyon here, this is Death Canyon here, and Grand Canyon further to the south. <clears throat> so the geomorphology of the Tetons is largely uh, an expression of active tectonic activity. And the primary uh, component of this tectonic system is the Teton Fault. So the Teton Fault here, which you can't see, 
uh, from space, but which um, is highlighted here in this, this cartoon that I just pulled from the National Park Service website, uh, is a major range bounding normal fault. So it bounds the Teton Range on its eastern side, and it's a normal fault, meaning you have a hanging wall that's sliding down relative to the football, or in the case of um, uh, Jackson Hole, you've got a, the valley here is moving down relative to the mountains. And the activity, the, the highly active nature of this fault uh, is testament to these, these very dramatic, sharp uh, uh, peaks which rise out of the valley. It's considered to be an active fault, uh, despite no major earthquakes in recent history. And so uh, here's a map of all recorded earthquakes uh, in the state of Wyoming. <coughs> And so uh, since, since the late 1800s, so from 1871 to present, all earthquakes with a magnitude of 2.5 or greater are shown on this map. And so you can uh, deduce many things from this map. One is that there's, there have been earthquakes in, in every county in, my, in the state of Wyoming, uh, but of course there's this bullseye um, or hotspot of tectonic activity here on the northwestern side. So this is. Yellowstone National Park here, um, and then here we're going through the town of Jackson down um, along the borderlands with Utah and Idaho. This is interesting for many reasons, but what you don't really see here is uh, many red dots right along Grand Teton National Park or along the Teton Fault itself. <laughs> so while the Teton Fault is certainly active, there have been no recorded earthquakes of this fault system over the last 104 years, or, or, or since 1870, uh, 1871 AD. We'll get back to this in a second. The fault itself is much older than the last 104 years, of course. And so uh, there is some ongoing controversy about exactly how old the fault is and when initiation along the fault began. Uh, but um, it seems to, there seems to be convergence uh, that the activity was initiated due to basin and range faulting uh, in the Miocene, or we'll just say roughly 10 million years ago, and that's been influenced by the migration of the Yellowstone hotspot into its present location. The total displacement along the fault since that time uh, is much greater than just the relief that's observed along the mountain range, uh, and it, it extends deep below the valley of Jackson Hole. And so that is upwards of six kilometers of total uh, offset along the fault, which depending on the, the age of initiation and the precise uh, distance you're using for this relief, you can put together some sort of long-term slip rate uh, along the fault. But of course, this, this offset doesn't occur peacefully. It does, it's not um, uh, just a gradual slip. It occurs through a series of catastrophic uh, earthquakes, which result in uh, displacement along the fault. Here's a paper taken, uh, or uh, I'm sorry, here's a figure taken from the paper by Foster et al. back in 2010, just showing a profile view of the Teton Range, again flanked on both sides by these uh, very deep basins, the Teton Basin to the west, and the basin of Jackson Hole uh, here to the east side of the range, and this is this dashed line is representing the Teton Fault uh, itself. And so you can see just if you uh, approximate the total uh, distance from the bottom of Jackson Hole to the summit of the mountains, you're on the order of 6,000 meters or, or six kilometers of displacement. But it's not just the fault that has uh, sculpted or created the Tetons. Uh, the, this really iconic geomorphology uh, is influenced by the fault, but also by periodic quaternary. And so what I've toggled on this map to the right here uh, is the approximate extent of mountain glaciers and the southern limit of the Cordilleran and uh, Laurentian ice sheets to the, the north of the map there. Um, but these are all mountain glaciers outside of the, the great ice sheets that existed during the last ice age. Here we refer to this ice age as the Pinedale Glaciation uh, for the type sections of glacial range just down uh, in the town of, outside of the town of Pinedale along the western Wind River Mountains. So I put a box around our um, uh, area of interest here. This is the, uh, the ice mass that covered Yellowstone, the Tetons, and the Wind River Mountain ranges. And what you see is that during the Pleistocene, or during this last glacial maximum, uh, 
this region harbored the largest volume of glacial ice outside of uh, the Great Ice Sheets. And we see evidence all over the landscape uh, for these glaciations, for not just the most recent glaciation, but all uh, previous glacial episodes. And those, uh, in common with tectonic activity, are responsible for sculpting uh, the mountains, which we know and love. <coughs> Many of these glacial tectonic features uh, are not that easily seen from space or even from the air. Uh, and so sometimes it's helpful to um, kind of increase our lens on the landscape. One tool set that we now have to take advantage of uh, is LIDAR. Um, and so the National Park Service flew the entire National Park and the Elk Refuge uh, and collected LIDAR imagery of this region here, and so I've just draped the boundaries of this LiDAR data set um, over a, a Google Earth base map here. And so this is one square meter resolution, um, uh, uh, elevation, um, an elevation model that, that contains pixels that are one square meter. So roughly the size of these squares in a carpet here, um, and that blankets the entire national park. So uh, importantly, this, this um, LiDAR imagery sees through vegetation, and so in places, particularly at lower elevations here in the valley, we can see things that are either completely covered by vegetation or that otherwise are so subtle you wouldn't necessarily be able to pick those out just on the trail uh, or if you were walking by. So here are some features that I thought I would highlight with the, the LiDAR data set here. This is the Jackson Lake Dam. The picture on the left is just from Google Earth. Uh, and then the, the image on the right is the the LiDAR image of that same region. So you can see the dam, you can see the roads here, you can see all sorts of infrastructure, or even past infrastructure that uh, disrupted the landscape. Further in towards the mountain front here, this is uh, an image on the left of Phelps Lake at the, the mouth of Death Canyon, uh, and the lake is sitting within its um, so this is a map view of Phelps Lake, which is shown in the colors here. Those colors signify water depth uh, within the lake. And surrounding the lake here, you see a, a bunch of parallel ridge lines, and these ridge lines are the moraines left by the glacier that occupied Death Canyon during the most recent glacial period. And so Phelps Lake, much like all lakes uh, along the eastern range frontier, uh, are bound by terminal moraine complexes uh, deposited during the last glacial interval up until around 15 or 14,000 years ago. And you can see all sorts of features uh, as you zoom into this data set here. Uh, on the left, you can see these debris fans. This is the valley here uh, at the base of some of these steep slopes and couloirs. They're debris fans and debris um, apexes. You can also see the Teton Fault Trace itself cutting right across some of these surfaces. So we'll be focusing uh, on the Teton Fault much of this talk here, and uh, this data set is, has, has really aided uh, and, and helped progress uh, studies of the fault itself. As you zoom in, we can see the, uh, the hiking trail here, or at least the old hiking trail, um, that hops up and over the northern, or the left ladder of the rain, uh, and does that big um, switch back as it makes its way down to the mouth of the uh, valley. These are individual boulders. Down here, you can see the delta fan uh, and then the, the stream channel as it enters the lake. So this is an incredible data set um, and um, really facilitates uh, some focused research on the lake. Okay. How is this case, by the way? Are, are we following along here? So, so much of this has been to set um, some context for uh, for my research and for our research here um, along the Eastern Range Front. So, based on some work um, by uh, my research group, but also others uh, before us, uh, we know that the glaciers that created these moraine systems along the Eastern Range Front. Um, persisted up until around 14,000 years ago, at which time they, these glaciers retreated rapidly up valley to higher elevations and then disappeared completely in most cases. Uh, in a few cases, there, there are some active glaciers, some glaciers along the range um, at higher elevations in these protected surfaces like the Teton Glacier or Schoolman Glacier. These features uh, 
uh, are either very small remnants of the once massive glaciers that occupied the valleys or have, have reformed in the relatively recent past uh, or the, the late Holocene, the last few thousand years. But the large glaciers, these, these valley glaciers, retreated around 14,000 years ago. We know that uh, based on exposure ages of boulders and bedrock in these valleys, uh, and also on basal ages of lake sediment cores, or uh, sediment cores taken from lakes that are impounded by these moraine systems. <clears throat> so that gives us an age of these features along the range front, and then we can measure the amount of offset uh, that has occurred since this time. Uh, and in places that's upwards of 30 meters of displacement uh, along the Teton Fault here that's displacing these glacial features. So we know the age of these features, or at least we're, we're starting to um, understand the age of these features. It, it seems that it might not be consistent along the entire range run. Uh, but, and then we can measure the displacement using direct measurements, of course, but, but also some of these remote sensing platforms, uh, and develop a long-term slip rate, or a slip rate, I should say, uh, since the time that these features were replaced. So this is a relatively coarse estimate of the slip rate of the fault, or the displacement rate of the fault, uh, since the age these features were deposited. So since roughly 15 or 14,000 years ago, and we come up with a rate of roughly two millimeters <coughs> per year, which is, fairly high, uh, and, and much higher than maybe the long-term uh, displacement rate of the fault, uh, depending on which age of initiation uh, you converge on. <clears throat> so this seems to be an active period of tectonic uh, displacement here along the fault, relative to the, the entire, to the, the long-term age of the fault. Uh, and unfortunately, we don't have a great understanding of how this displacement occurred. In other words, we don't have a very accurate paleoseismic history during this time period, um, despite some previous um, investigations. And so I'll walk us through what, what is really known about the fault uh, over the last 15,000, 14,000 years. Can you, uh, on the last slide, can you just put the fault and just trace the fault? Right, so on the left screen here, I'm showing you the fault trace. We're looking, at, again, in Matthew, much of the, the imagery I'll show you is in Matthew, so bird's eye view of the landscape, and I agree with those of you who might find this difficult to see, but I tried to add a hill shape here to highlight um, regions of topographic high and topographic low. So we're looking at bird's eye view at the mouths of Avalanche, Garnet, and Glacier Gulch Canyons. For those of you who are familiar with that, the Loop and Meadows Trailhead is uh, somewhere right in this general area. Um, the Taggart Lake Trailhead is, again, uh, somewhere in this general area. <clears throat> and so uh, right along the range front, this linear feature here is the surface expression of the Teton Fault that is displacing these Pleistocene glacial features. So this would be kind of an oblique profile view of what we're looking at here. Are the circles core samples, or what are they represent? Yes, these are core samples, uh, or locations of sediment cores that we've taken. Um, from lakes here, I, uh, I'm not going to highlight those, but yes, that's what exactly what those are. So those are the locations of sediment cores that we've taken from Taggart, Bradley, Surprise, and Delta Lakes. So what do we know about the the uh, activity of the Teton Fault since deglaciation? Interpretations of paleo shorelines in Jackson Lake suggest the total of eight to 10 major earthquakes uh, since deglaciation. So again, this displacement did not occur gradually. It, it occurred through a series of major earthquakes, <coughs> each earthquake producing some amount of uh, vertical displacement. Paleo shorelines uh, in the lake suggest that there have been eight to 10 uh, earthquakes that effectively shifted the, the position of the shoreline in Jackson Lake, preserving those earlier shorelines. And, and folks, uh, Pierce and Good, 1992, sorry, I don't have that reference up here, suggested that there have been uh, a series of um, shoreline altering events or, or earthquakes which have occurred since deglaciation because Jackson Lake, like other lakes in the Teton Range, uh, was 
covered by uh, a glacier, in this case, this, the southern extent of the Yellowstone ice cap, up until that time. And so any previous evidence uh, would have been censored or erased, and it's only been since deglaciation that that lake has been left um, uh, pristine. And so they counted the series. Why does that say Mexico? Right, so this, this is not the, the we don't have multi beam imagery of Jackson Lake. Uh -huh. uh, if you haven't seen it. Is this Jackson Lake? This is not, this is the Gulf of Mexico here. So oh, yeah. Yeah, there's so, you go. So, this is the country of Mexico. So, I'm just trying, these are paleo shorelines here, uh, but I'm just trying for reference. What's the scale of a major earthquake? So, it, I, I'll get a, a scale of the magnitude or of the displacement. Magnitude. So, you know, you're, you're beating me to punch, but I'll get there in a second. So, uh, in addition to this indirect evidence for a series of earthquakes, uh, uh, Bob Smith and John Bird and others uh, conducted a trench study across, they excavated a trench, a physical trench, across the uh, a strand of the Teton Fault at Granite Creek, the mouth of Granite Canyon. This is back a few years ago now. <clears throat> but this trench, Data from the trench, which uh, I'm, present, I'm just showing here uh, an image from John Bird's uh, dissertation thesis at the University of Utah, suggests one or perhaps two major uh, ground rupturing earthquakes occurred, which produced a total of 4.1 meters of displacement. So something on the order of the height of this room. Uh, and uh, that occurred at either 8,000 years ago, if it was a single event, or if it was two events. And, and I've been in some of these trenches, and I, and I, so I can appreciate how it's, it's quite difficult to say with certainty uh, how many events you might be looking at, because it's, 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 it's very complicated stratigraphy. And so they think that it was either one or perhaps two events. Uh, if it was one event that occurred at 8,000 years ago and produced a little over four meters of displacement, if it was two events, the second event, more recent event, occurred at roughly five and a half thousand years ago, and if that was the case, that's the the respective displacement that each of those events created for the vertical offset. <clears throat> Based on this amount of vertical displacement and estimates of the total length of rupture along the fault, uh, they suggest that these surface rupturing earthquakes are of a magnitude of, uh, of, of about 7, or up to 7.3. Uh, so these are huge earthquakes on the order of the Hegden Lake or Bora Peak earthquakes of the historical past. <clears throat> These estimates are, are based on the total amount of displacement, but also the total length <coughs> of the fault that was displaced. And there is still uncertainty regarding whether the fault is segmented into multiple discrete segments, or if it acts as one singular fault along the entire matrix. <coughs> Because the total displacement at this location, at the trench location, is roughly 15 <coughs> meters, these data suggest that the remainder of vertical offset, so if remember it's four meters of offset measured in the trench, and if it's a total of 15 meters, the, the uh, difference there is 11 meters, or roughly 70% of the total offset that's observed on the landscape, must have been accomplished between deglaciation and 8,000 years ago, if indeed that 8,000 years ago was the most recent event. If it was the five, if it, there were two events, we would say that this is all accomplished uh, between deglaciation and five and a half thousand years ago. Regardless, it's indicating that the majority of displacement along the fault happened early on, very soon after deglaciation, and that it has been that the most recent event or most recent events uh, are, are quite old there. There haven't been many large displacement surface rupturing earthquakes uh, in the recent past. And so folks became aware of this and started suggesting or, or uh, uh, <clears throat> playing around with models that would uh, simulate the response of the crust in this location to unloading by those large ice masses that blanketed Yellowstone and the Teton Mountain Range. <clears throat> and so uh, modeling simulations by Andrea Handel and others suggests that unloading of the crust at the, left, the end of the last ice age may have caused a post-glacial slip rate increase. So as this is a normal fault system, 
The idea being that as you release the overburden pressure of those ice masses, the mountain range, uh, the fault can, is sort of freed to uh, become more active. And that sit, and so we see a clustering of earthquakes, or a, uh, a swarm of earthquakes immediately following deglaciation uh, that then taper off uh, with some time following deglaciation uh, and lead to a relatively quiescent period that we observe today. So this is based on um, the work that those folks have done. Simply using that Granite Creek trench data and then uh, this crustal model. Question. Is there any way you can tell what the depth of the earthquake was? The high percentage? So I know other folks, um, including uh, Bob Smith and others at the University of Utah, are trying to image the fault, uh, the fault plain itself, extending below uh, the floor of Jackson Lake. I'm oh, sorry, the, the, the Valley of Jackson Hole. Um, I, I don't know how you would determine the, the depth of the focus of an individual earthquake in the past, uh, but they, they're certainly trying to image the fault plain itself. Other questions on this? Yeah. So at that time of the unloading, the, prior to that, there was was most of the ice over the mountains that, or over the valley side of the fault? <laughs> so so this, it's hard. Because it doesn't sound, if something sounds funny about deloading a massive amount of ice off the valley floor and then floor, causing the floor to drop. Right, so the majority of ice mass in the- I think there'd be a rebound or something. Mm -hmm. So that's a way of thinking of it as a rebound. The majority of ice covering the Tetons was, of course, covering the higher elevations, which is on the foot wall, or the foot block of the normal fault. And so it's covering this left side of the diagram here. And so when that ice is melted, indeed, this, this modeling study suggests that there was a rebound, that the foot wall then popped up uh, because the majority of ice was sitting here on the foot wall uh, relative to the hanging wall. So the foot, once that ice melted, the foot wall popped up relative to the hanging wall, causing greater earthquake frequency. Could the melted water affect it somehow? It's possible that, you know, it's, it's known that water traveling along fault plains can lubricate the fault and result in um, greater fault activity. And it's worth uh, mentioning that this is not a new idea. Normal faults in, in uh, glaciated regions around the world, for example, Norway and, and other high latitude regions seem to demonstrate this type of behavior. Do we, do we, oh, we've been told that the valley itself was, was covered five to 6,000 feet of ice. You're saying that the mountains had even more? <laughs> the higher elevations would have had more. Okay. The valley itself only had ice up into the present location of effectively Jackson Lake uh, or Moran Junction. Where, where we are here and all the way up past the town of Moose was ice free during the most recent glacial episode, during the penultimate glacial, during what we refer to as the Bull Lake Glacial, named for the Bull Lake on the, uh, the east side of the rivers, that ice extended south through where we are now to, uh, to Munger Mountain. Uh, so there was ice in the valley at that time. However, all uh, fault activity that occurred between the penultimate glacial and the most recent glacial episode has been censored by the um, by the activity of these glaciers during the most recent or the last glacial accident. So we don't have much evidence for faulting along the fault scar here of the Teton Range um, due to kind of surface mass wasting processes and the activity of glaciers during the most recent or pine glacial. Question? Um, it's my understanding that the Tetons themselves were not covered, but uh, Snow King and other areas on the other side were? During the Pinedale Glacial? Mm -hmm. I am certainly not the expert on this. I can try and speak for some of my uh, colleagues here, but <coughs> as I understand it, Ken Pierce led, who would be considered the, the expert on um, glacial chronologies and history of the valley. Um, he frequents the, the, he gave a field trip, as I understand it, last week, and he frequents the area. Um, so he would be the person to talk to. As far as I know, there was no ice occupying 
snow came during the Pinedale Glacial. That's correct. It uh, only got as far south as about the Burnham Ridge, roughly. And at the airport, uh, during the Bull Lake glaciation, 130, 150,000 years ago, about 2,500 feet of ice is the estimate. Where we are here? At the airport, okay. about 1,500 here. So this this is an image of the, uh, the Pine Hill glaciation. Again, the majority of mass is over Yellowstone. The amount of ice actually covering the Tetons was really just these valley glaciers um, that extended off of the eastern and western sides of the mountain range. During previous glacial episodes, as evidenced by those very thick lust deposits um, south of town and by glacial features, we know that there were glacial advances that passed down through the valley, but not during the last glacial maximum. And so what this study is based on and this trenching study is based on is the amount of offset that's occurred along the fault in these locations since the last unloading of the mountain range or the last glacial maximum. It's a very complex history. I can, if folks are interested, that group led by uh, Ken Pierce and others just put out a USGS professional paper that's about that thick on the uh, glacial history and chronology of the uh, Jackson, Hole, and Yellowstone region. Uh, and I have a copy that's small enough to email around if, if anyone's interested on my computer. Okay. Other questions before I pose my questions here? So these are my two research questions. One is, is there a complete record of past earthquake events in Grand Teton National Park that are reliably recorded in geologic archives? And if so, what is the timing and frequency of major earthquakes along the faults? So to address these questions, we came up with a few hypotheses based on some preliminary work uh, that we had done here in um, these lake basins. And it was that past earthquakes were strong ground shape ground shaking events generated multiple types of slope failures, including delta failures. So these the inflows to many of these lakes are on the western side of the lake, which is right along this uh, Teton Fault Scarp, because the valleys are upstream, um, trend up into the mountain range to the west. So many of the lakes have these uh, relatively small and steep inflow deltas of unconsolidated sediments that are sitting right next to the fault itself. So we thought that past activity of the fault would induce delta slope failures. Uh, also, subaqueous gravity flows, so other slopes within the lake, maybe slopes around the perimeter, or in the case of these moraine-bound lakes, along the back slope of these impounding moraines, uh, could have failed. And then also landslides from slopes above the lake um, that um, uh, slid out onto and into the lake basins themselves. And so to test these hypotheses, this hypothesis, uh, we set out to identify and date a suite of these slope failure deposits identified in multiple lake basins uh, positioned along a broad section of the fault. And so here I'm showing you an you oblique know, aerial image or satellite image, a Google Earth image in this case, of the eastern range front where I've highlighted the uh, Teton Fault Scarp in black. Um, and these yellow dots here uh, correspond to the location of uh, sediment cores that we collected from various locations within the lake, and the red numbers just refer to uh, the six different drainage systems that we focused on. So from, uh, from left to right here, or from south to north, the lake basins are Phelps Lake at the bottom of Death Canyon, uh, Taggart Lake here at the bottom of Avalanche Canyon, Bradley Lake at the bottom of uh, Garnet Canyon. This is uh, not really a lake, Number four here signifies Glacier Gulch. Though there are a series of Pinedale Moraines at the bottom of Glacier Gulch that encircle a kind of a meadow, which has been suggested for a long time. Uh, Freddie Alfred Sell back in the 30s suggested that this was potentially one of these similar Piedmont lakes that has just been filled in with sediment, in this case due to more recent activity of the Teton Glacier, which has been in existence for uh, the duration of policy. Moving on, this is Jenny Lake, and then of course, uh, Lee Lake to the north. What's that red dot, I mean yellow dot right there? This is Lake Solitude at the head of Cascade, the north fork of Cascade Canyon. Uh, 
collect incentive course from that to both study the, uh, remember this is a part of a larger project, to study the alpine uh, environment and climate history of the range, but the basal ages of that sediment core, in other words, the age of lake solitude, will tell us uh, the timing of complete, essentially complete disappearance of this valley glacier that occupied Cascade Canyon at the end of the Pleistocene. So we covered this before, but um, I think we're all familiar with these, these broad U-shaped valleys that cut into the range, and that's because most of our favorite hiking trails um, tend to, uh, to head up these valleys. It, it's a very efficient way to get high up into the Tetons or to, um, to get deep into the range. And so many of these valleys here um, emanate out of the eastern front of the range and terminate into a lake basin. And these lakes were formed when the glaciers that carved these, these uh, depressions retreated at the end of the Pleistocene, roughly 14,000 years ago. And so sediment fill contained in the lakes then will uh, preserve some record of many things, including the timing of deglaciation, which is uh, also the timing of lake inception, or lake birth, you can think of it, uh, and also a continuous and dateable record of all sorts of, of environmental parameters. And so lakes are out there on the landscape continuously accumulating sediment, whether it's windblown or brought in by um, rivers. Uh, and along with that sediment are all sorts of indicators related to um, environmental conditions or geologic conditions, or in this case, uh, potentially seismic activity along the Teton Fault. So here's a picture of, um, of a few of us, a, a few um, folks out on uh, Phelps Lake uh, in, in sort of wintry conditions out on the frozen lake surface where we auger a hole through the lake ice and deploy some manner of coring device which in reality is kind of a glorified tube that we um, send down to the bottom of the lake uh, and fill that tube with mud that's, that's resting there uh, at the bottom and then haul it up uh, and, and perform analyses on it. Is that easier to do in the winter? It is much easier to well. It is easier to, to collect the core in winter. Of course, it's much colder and, and more difficult to be out in the elements in the winter time. But in many cases, um, this type of coring work involves uh, remaining precisely fixed in one location so, so that you can re-enter the same hole uh, multiple times and thereby collect the entire sediment thickness in the lake. In some of these lakes, like in Phelps Lake here, there's upwards of 15 meters of sediment in the bottom of the lake. So, it's, so to collect all that in a single drive is, is sort of unrealistic with the type of equipment that you'd be using in this region. Um, and so we have to re-enter the same hole. You could try anchoring in uh, 60, 70 meters of water and hope the wind doesn't blow it, hope that you stay in, uh, in place, but that's sort of unrealistic. So we go out in the wintertime. Uh, I put together just a little cartoon to help uh, visualize the formation of these lake bases here. So this is what maybe Cascade Canyon or Death Canyon looked like um, during the Pine Dead Glaciation with glaciers that extend all the way down to the moraine crests or the, the moraine complexes that are left on the landscape today. Then around 14,000 years ago, these, this, these glaciers began to retreat in response to climate variations that occurred globally and were felt or quite pronounced here locally. Um, around 15 to 14,000 years ago, and that retreat persisted up valley to higher elevations relatively quickly, exposing in some cases, like in Avalanche Canyon and others, um, some, some lakes along the way. Uh, and then many valleys also contain surf lakes at the heads. Uh, and so we have this progression of lake age from the valley floor up elevation to the surf heights here. And since the lakes have been uncovered, they've been continuously accumulating sediments. So the goal of this project is to access these sediments and to learn from them what we can about um, surface processes and tectonic activity along the range front. So that takes the form of um, uh, geophysical surveys. In this case, we performed a seismic survey of Jenny Lake. Uh, we've also collected multi-beam bathymetry of Jenny Lake. And so uh, that just involves uh, cruising around on the lake surface with, in this case, a, an acoustic device that uh, penetrates through the water column, but also through the sediment fill at the bottom of the lake and allows us to image 
the, the, the sediment stratigraphy at the bottom of Kenny Lake. Uh, we then also, of course, go out and collect these lake sediment cores. And so in the springtime, that involves uh, traveling out on the surfaces of the lakes, um, towing sleds or using uh, skis. We have poured some of the smaller lakes that are easier to anchor in um, and are a little bit more manageable. Pouring those in the summer is, is more feasible because they're, they're relatively shallow. So this is Delta Lake here at the foot of the Teton Glacier in the background. Uh, and this lake is only about seven and a half meters deep uh, as compared to Jenny Lake, which is uh, 75 meters deep. So I figured I'd show just a few pictures of the sediment coring here. Here is uh, the, uh, the tube that we're about to deploy to the bottom of the lake. Uh, in this case, we discovered that standard lake core polycarbonate tubing was insufficient for penetrating these dense glacial units at the bottom of the sediment fill, so we resorted to using uh, aluminum irrigation piping that we just collect from some uh, farm stock uh, suppliers over in Idaho. That seems to work pretty well. Um, we've also just uh, repurposed a car jack here to, to hang the, so these, these are deployed on cables right through the, the water column. Uh, and we just hang the cables off of a car jack. And the, these folks on either side of the car jack here are um, holding on to one end of a rope that's tied to a weight um, at the top of this core, the top of this core head here. And it's, uh, they're just pulling up and letting the weight fall and tapping this, um, this tube down into the mud, in this case at the bottom of a jet lake. This past season, um, I, I um, brought out a much more substantial coring system um, that is specifically designed for collecting um, thick sediment sequences in deep glacial lakes or deep water bodies. Um, so it's this custom-made Austrian device called the Unitech. Uh, and so here we're out on Phelps Lake. Um, this is uh, the last week of March of this year, collecting sediment cores from Phelps Lake. And again, um, we got over 15 meters of sediment uh, in a series of two meter drives. And so this is the, the same principle as that handy car jack. It's just much more secure um, and allows you to collect longer and deeper, or, or longer cores from deeper water. That's a great question. So the question is how do we decide which, where in the lake we're going to core? That's through a, a combination of uh, the position of the lake relative to the hill slopes around it, or, or the Teton Fault here in the background, which is, is difficult to see, um, and the, the symmetry or the, the water depth, the shape of the basin, and then if we, where we have it, the seismic stratigraphy. So where we have the sediment map through the seismic imaging, that would uh, inform us where we want to work. For, for this project, where we're really targeting these disturbance events, we're, we're, we're trying to core on the, the very um, the, the fault proximal regions of the lake, those that are near active hill slopes here or near the fault itself. Uh, because of that, we commonly encounter these really thick gravel and, and in some places boulder deposits, um, which can fill the <coughs> uh, so then we have to come this further ahead. So there's this, there's kind of this Goldilocks um, situation where we want to be close enough to the fault where we're really feeling its impact on the stratigraphy or the sedimentation of the lake, um, but not too close such that we physically can't core through some of these disturbance deposits. So yeah, this is beautiful work. Sometimes it involves long days out in the field uh, or even working past dark, um, which is unfortunate because as soon as the sun goes down, despite how warm it might be during the day, everything then begins to freeze up at night. But it's the kind of thing, once you start, you have to sort of finish uh, what you started before you can pack up. <clears throat> OK, so we, we conduct some of this field work here at uh, each of these lake basins or each of these yellow dots um, at, over the course of the past few years. And I'm uh, excited to present some of this data here. We're going to focus on the results from Jenny Lake, uh, which has kind of been the focus of our firepower. Um, and we've now been expanding that, to, as you just saw from Fells Lake, and, Lake and um, some of the lakes in between. So here is a, uh, a map view of Jenny Lake, uh, which I'm sure many of you have been to. This is just a, a beautiful lake basin in just an incredible spot here. Um, 
It's positioned at roughly uh, 2,070 meters above sea level. It's roughly five square kilometers and has a max depth of 75 meters. So this is a map view of the lake at the mouth of Cascade Canyon here. These colors are, are signifying water depth. Uh, and we produced this image of water depth um, uh, through a, uh, uh, a multi-beam uh, seismic sonar device around the lake, which produces centimeter scale uh, elevation um, imagery of the lake. So uh, comparable in detail to the LIDAR, which you can see uh, in gray. Uh, the landscape LIDAR, while it goes through vegetation, it doesn't go through water. And so to get the, the uh, topography of the lake bottom here, we need to uh, use a different type of device. So this is multi-beam uh, swaps uh, uh, imaging, uh, just like they would use in, in an ocean basin. Uh, so the sediments in the lake record the retreat of the Paleo Cascade Canyon Glacier. And then the, the, some of the geophysics in the lake core data that I'll show you uh, reveal a really complex lake floor morphology and this interesting glacial and tectonic history um, that's occurred over the last 14,000 years. Uh, for reference, again, this is the Teton Fault, which you can see cutting the, uh, the, the right lateral moraines of the glacier here, these moraines encircle the lake. You can see multiple crests of this, uh, this Paleo Glacier here that's impounding the lake. You can follow the fault trace right through the bottom of the west side of Jenny Lake. It seems like it's actually split into uh, perhaps two strands here. This is that uh, inflow delta, the, the boat launch, which many of you have visited if you've taken a boat across Jenny Lake or hiked around. This, I think somewhere right around here. Uh, and there's some interesting features that, that show up in the Bethany tree itself. So you see this, this central over deepened basin uh, in, the, in the center of the lake that's encircled by this relatively uh, shallow shoal or, or uh, plateau surface here. Um, and then we see uh, all around the impounding back slope of the moraine, there's evidence for um, some slope failures uh, of that unstable slope. And, and in particular, I'd like to draw your attention to these large block and fan deposits here, positioned below clearly defined head scarps and runout paths of landslides on the hill slopes above the lake here and here, and I'll, and I'll get to those um, in a little bit. So I'm gonna drape over this map uh, some lines and some dots. The white dots here are the locations uh, number one through five of lake sediment cores that we collected from Jenny Lake in varying water depths and in varying uh, locations. And then the lines here uh, signify the uh, positions of these uh, seismic profiles that we've collected to map the uh, sediment thickness. In the lake. <coughs> and then I've just highlighted the Teton Valley in red and the locations of those two landslides in blue with those stars indicating the head scars of those two minutes lines. So here's some seismic <coughs> imagery. So some of you might be interested in seismic mm -hmm. geography. Uh, it's kind of a window into the Earth, really. And so this, there's many applications for this. In this case, we're, we're imaging the, the sediment fill within Jenny Lake. And so there's two transects that I'm, I'm showing you here. One is on the top from the mouth of the canyon out to the distal eastern shoreline, so that's labeled A to A prime. And then the other is roughly north-south uh, from B to B prime from north to south, running kind of lengthwise down uh, the lake through the, the center deep basin. So uh, here from the, the mouth of the canyon outwards, we see the steep slope. We can see the Teton Fault Trace as it's offsetting these lake sediments. So we're seeing these, these conformable lake sediments that are being offset by the, the fault scar. And then we see these large, this large landslide deposit out here in um, the north sector of the lake. Uh, and then um, this uh, relatively shallow plateau surface, which is also covered by lake sediments. And then this is the moraine up here, like the high top right um, is the, the moraine. Uh, folks sitting on that side of the room, are you able to see this screen as I've been pointing, or would you like me to go back and forth? Goodbye. <laughs> Is that North Lake Star on the fault of the left side? This one here? The star, yeah. Yes, yeah, so that, that is the fault here running right through Laurel Lake <coughs> and down. And it gets very convoluted here, and I think that's because, so the question was, is, is this headscarf right on the fault? 
with a headscarf of this northern landslide. That landslide is a little bit different than the southern landslide, as you can see in the imagery. The southern landslide is, uh, is, has a deeper headscarf and is more confined, and that's actually ripping out through bedrock of the, um, this hill slope at, near the mouth of the canyon. This landslide is, is, is flowing through relatively poorly consolidated Pleistocene glacial deposits um, and moraine deposits here uh, and here. And so it's, it's, it has a kind of more diffuse and shallower look to it. And it has this kind of crumpled rug topography uh, that is influenced by the by um, uh, faulting that's occurred, uh, but it's it's not very well organized until it gets a little further north, and then we can trace the fault scarp again further north from right above Spring Lake there by by Laurel Lake and um, further north from that. So it's uh, pretty interesting how kind of diffuse the, the scarp is here. Have you uh, have you dated? these slides either terrestrially or under the lake to try to see if they're from the same event, they're from the same, same age roughly? Yeah, great question. So so uh, I have a slide to show you that. So we've dated both on land, we've dated boulders and bedrock surfaces within the slide paths using exposure age dating techniques. And then we dated the features directly uh, that are the deposits of these landslides within the lake using radiocarbon in the lake setting course. And briefly here, so panel B is showing this north-south transect that, um, again, goes right through the center basin of the lake where you have the, the greatest accumulation of sediment, around 10 meters of, of post-glacial sediment here. Uh, and then you can see this partially buried landslide deposit that um, we, we ran right through um, on our survey. So the plateau, Gen 2, is that related to the Gen 4 yeah, so uh, this this uh, pattern that you see of a, a center over deep in basin that's surrounded by a, a shallower um, perimeter seems to be common. And then this, this kind of throughput here um, it, of deeper water is quite common when we look at the definitory of, of lakes along the range front. So we see that in Lee Lake. We see that in Bradley Lake. Uh, Tiger Lake is this kind of its own beast, but we see it in Phelps Lake also. And so we had the glacier coming down, relatively steep slope, excavate, entering, uh, leaving the, the confinement of the valley, uh, leaving the bedrock of the valley floor, and entering the, the unconsolidated valley fill uh, of the of the Teton of the Jackson Hole Valley, not Cascade Canyon, which is relatively easy to excavate. And so it digs down deep, causing causing this deep basin, uh, and then kind of rebounds a little bit, um, and so we see the perimeters of these lakes are much shallower. How, how long do you think for that retreat? The, the retreat the, from the glacier retreat? Uncovering the lake or uncovering the whole valley? No. The lake part is on the order of a few decades, maybe. Very, very quick. So fast that it's quite difficult to actually tell. So as glaciers, um, begin to retreat, so they're, they're basically pinned, this is, and this is analogous to what's happening along other glaciated regions of the world, like Antarctica, where we have glaciers that have advanced out into water bodies, are uh, relatively stable in place along some sort of grounding line. In this case, it's the impounding moraine itself. Once it retreats away from that grounding line, across its own over deep and basin, it becomes very unstable. And so calving happens very quickly, and so you'd expect rapid retreat across this deep water basin. Um, and, and we think we see that in the sediment cores and in the seismic trajectory because we see a relatively brief window of period where we have uh, uh, ice contact sediments, or chill sediments, uh, and then uh, percussion sediments that only have a, a small amount of uh, ice wrapped debris or, or, or a period, a small, a representatively small amount of time where ice was actually calving into the water, producing icebergs, which of course melt and then would drop uh, material that was incorporated into the ice mass itself, and that would get incorporated into the sediment. So, so it would have happened very quickly, most likely. I, I, I didn't get how, what the age of those two lands was. We'll get there, yeah. So I've got a slide that focuses just on those. Okay, then I don't know. Is uh, Gen 2, is that part of the moraine? So this here, 
you know, the brain is actually up here, um, and, it's, and I've cut it off, uh, this image. So this is in 40 meters of water depth, so this is about 40 meters. It's, it's still quite deep. Uh, and, and this is, I think, valley fill material and not marine material. Um, based on kind of its shape, it's, it's very hard to see that the um, reflectors sort of disappear here, and it's generally opaque. And so this is a seismic basement here, which kind of corresponds to the, the valley fill down here, um, I, I believe is just the, the, the basement of what the glacier excavated down to. And then you have a, a moraine feature, which extends way up into the, the, the ceiling of this room um, that was deposited in, 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 in a sort of uh, accordion manner, or a compounded moraine that was uh, deposited at the snout of the glacier itself. So the, the shape of these, the, the landslides, as there is, so I should say that there's a, there's a whole the bunch question? of vertical, the question? sorry, what was that? What was the question? The question was, uh, can I explain why the landslides are shaped like this in the seismic imagery, is that right? And so I, I would say that they don't actually look like this in real life. We're looking at, as you, if you kind of imagine what's happening, we're looking at a few kilometers of horizontal distance and, and only maybe 100 or a little more than 100 meters of vertical distance. And so these are greatly vertically exaggerated images. And so they don't really look like this. If, we, if, we, if I um, scale the, the vertical and the horizontal dimensions of these images appropriately, um, you'd see these are much more subdued features um, that occupy a larger, uh, that, that are uh, more kind of gradual mounds of debris. The reason why they have this sort of ghosting effect that happens here is because it's very unconsolidated and spatially heterogeneous, and we're, we're cruising by in one location, and so we have, uh, there is the, the, uh, the impact of, of perhaps boulders or mounds that, are, that, are, that we're only kind of scarcely um, riding over with our trackway, which then insert themselves in, in kind of um, uh, uh, interesting ways into the, the seismic stratigraphy. So we're sort of integrating over a swath um, using this CHIRP seismic imaging system. And so uh, if you have uh, a region that has a whole lot of spatial variability in a relatively small uh, region, that's why you get this kind of compounded nested features of topography, which might not actually look like that in that one location. Geophysics is, um, is uh, complex. So we're trying to develop these images based on geophysics, which is maybe not um, the most accurate representation of what is going on there. So I would, you know, in your minds, I would maybe not picture this landslide look like this, with these two giant pillars here, but maybe look at how it's expressed in, in map view um, as these block and fan deposits here. Is there another question that I missed? Yes. Most of us have probably hiked that trail around Juni Lake. Yes. And on where those red dotted lines, the Teton Fault, is there any surface uh, thing that we can see, physical thing that we can see that could show us where the fault is, is there a ledge, or is there anything along there that, that we could look for? Yeah, it's a great great question. So uh, the question was, is the, the surface expression of the fault uh, visible as you're hiking around? And it, it certainly is. If, if you're hiking around the lake here, I believe you have the option of either staying right along the lake floor, or I think, I'm not sure if it's still marked or not, but there is, and there was, another trail that goes higher up along the moraine, and that one goes right along the moraine crest, and if you're paying attention as you're hiking, you will most certainly notice where the fault cuts right across the moraine. It becomes, the, you know, you're hiking along this relatively uh, defined crest of the moraine, and then all of a sudden it just gets flat and kind of jumbled, uh, and that is the fault ripping right through it. The fault in this location actually isn't just a vertical offset, there's some component of, of lateral offset that happens here also, and so you'll, you can, take note of that as you're hiking. It's, of course, it's relatively subtle and it's unmarked, but if you're um, 
if you're kind of paying attention, you can see it. You can also trace the fault as it runs southward here, just to the west of those ponds, those moose ponds. So if you find a good place on the moraine here, uh, I don't want to advocate hiking off trail, but if you do hike off trail, you'll find a place where you can, you can look and see this, this fault scarf uh, running southward towards the Lupin Meadows parking lot, right along the ranch front itself. Well, it's also really easy to see that offset position be under a map looking south. As yes. you hike straight lake along that edge of the lake, you look south and you can see the offset on the rain on the south side of the channel. Now, at one point, did you mention that it was 15 meters? Was the slide that went underneath was total? 15 meters, you went four and one, and then you went 11, and yeah, so that was, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. That 15 meters of displacement is what is measured about, oh geez, 40 kilometers south of here at, at Grand Canyon. Oh. So the displacement, the total displacement <laughs> of the scarp varies along strike quite a bit. And in some places it's, it's 10 to 15 meters, other places it's 30 meters and even more. Um, so, so it varies, and that has to do with whether or not the fault is indeed segmented or rupturing the same amount along its entire trace, or the age of those features uh, that are being offset. And about what time was that year was? So in this case, <coughs> we're suggesting that this moraine was abandoned about 15 to 14,000 years ago. And so we're saying that this amount of displacement, uh, or in this case, the lake was deglaciated 14,000 years ago, so that amount of displacement occurred since 14,000 years ago. So we're assuming that these surfaces were reset by glacial erosion or were deposited by the glaciers themselves. And so as soon as construction stopped on the moraine, that's the age we're using for the amount of displacement that's occurred. Thank you. There's a lot in this one image. Uh, we can talk about this for a while, but I think we should move on. Uh, we can come back to that. Okay, so that's the geophysics. As I showed you, we also collected sediment cores, and here's three uh, intervals or snapshots of what some of these sediment cores look like. So we have, um, in all cases here, uh, upwards is to the top, and then uh, I'm showing about, what is that, 20 centimeters of core section from top to bottom. These are three different cores. Uh, I just I kind of pulled these out of a hat just to show you, highlight some features here and to explain how we develop a chronology for these sediments. So of course, when you collect any sort of sedimentary archive or if you're looking at a sedimentary exposure, to understand any sort of process that resulted in the, the production, transport, and deposition of that sediment, it's nice to be able to put it within a temporal context. And to do that, we have various techniques uh, that we employ to collect ages of uh, horizon in that sediment or of the sediments themselves. In this case, I'm sure most folks have heard of radiocarbon dating. And so in this case, we can date organic material that's incorporated into the sediments uh, using the, uh, this tried and true method of radiocarbon where we're measuring the amount of uh, relatively rare isotope of carbon, this unstable carbon-14, that's uh, preserved within that organic material. So we can use radiocarbon dating, and we can also use tephra stratigraphy, or the stratigraphy of volcanic ash deposits from eruptions, volcanic eruptions of known age. So it's pretty unique here, uh, and this wasn't something that I was necessarily expecting to find in all of these lakes, but all Teton lakes contain ash deposits from the eruption of Mount Mazama, which is when Crater Lake was formed. <laughs> Uh, roughly seven and a half thousand years ago, and from Glacier Peak in Washington, uh, an eruption of that volcano that took place right around the same time as deglaciation of the Tetons, so it presents a really valuable isochron or um, uh, uh, horizon that we can use to um, develop a chronology here. So here's an example of the Glacier Peak ash in cores from, uh, I believe this is Taggart Lake and this is Jenny Lake. Uh, and then we also have a way of, of uh, counting annual layers within the lake when we're back to the glacial uh, times when there was still a glacier in the canyon. So after the glacier had uncovered the lake, there was this 
brief window of time when there was it was retreating up valley, delivering glacial erosion products to the lake uh, in the form of glacial flowers. So I'm sure many of you have um, seen pictures of glacial lakes. For example, Delta Lake here in the Tetons, it has this, this interesting kind of aquamarine look to it, different from non-glacial lakes, and that's due to the amount of fine-grained sediment in suspension in the water column, which gives the lake that that interesting uh, kind of gray blue look. That fine-grained sediment only settles out of the water column during seasonal ice cover and forms this, this clay and silt-rich cap, um, which happens every year during seasonal ice cover. And so it gives us this annual stratigraphy um, based on seasonal differences in grain size that are deposited in glacial lakes. So at the bottom of these cores, we have meters and meters of um, glacial sediments in the form of these, these annual couplets that are referred to as uh, classic varks. So we can um, perform annual layer counting on these, much the same as you'd be counting uh, rings in a tree, a slab or a tree. So these are the three primary uh, techniques that we use to develop chronologies for the majority of the sediment cores. For the, for the last few centuries, we have other techniques. Uh, but this is how we develop our chronologies. And for this study, where we're trying to determine the number of past disturbance events that were generated by earthquakes, <coughs> the conceptual model here is that we, we target locations where we think slope failures would occur in the lake basin. So this is from actually Lake Tahoe, this image on the right, uh, where they employed a similar strategy trying to understand the uh, fault dynamics of the Tahoe uh, fall roof uh, fault system. And so in, in, in this paper by Maloney and others, each of these colored horizons here uh, is what they're um, suggesting is an earthquake disturbance interval, and they collected sediment core through these a series of these disturbance intervals. So we did much the same thing here in Jenny Lake, and I'll be showing you data um, from two from from uh, predominantly two core locations. This this site here, kind of this fault proximal site, and then this location out in the uh, kind of the dead center of the lake. So here's a segment of one of these sediment cores that we collected. And as you can see, there's, uh, in this case, two uh, anomalous disturbance deposits uh, that interrupt the, um, the lake sediment fill. So here we're, we're looking at this, this sediment core uh, along depth here. And instead of um, up and down, we're looking at it as if the core is lying down on its side. <coughs> so up is to, to my side here, to the left of the room, and down sequence is to the right. And so there's a bunch of interesting things going on here. On, uh, first, at around 150 centimeter depth, we can see the Mount Zama tephra layer. So that's been dated across the entire continent of North America and in the Greenland ice cap. We're, we think there have been multiple eruptions of this volcano at around this time, but for the most part, this is very well dated. <coughs> at around 7.6 thousand years ago. Then we see this uh, disturbance event here that um, is, is about six centimeters Thick, and it's characterized, um, like the one below it, by coarse sediments. In some cases, we see coarse sands and, even, and pebbles or cobbles at the bottom of these units that find upwards, in, in all cases, um, to a, a silt or clay cap. So we see normal grading through these deposits. Oftentimes, they'll have uh, a very sharp or non-conformable basal contact. Um, indicative of an unconformity of a rapid uh, pulse or turbidite deposit happening uh, within the lake. And so this, um, for those of you who are familiar with these, is it's just like the classic bound sequence of a turbidite deposit that we'd be maybe more familiar with off the coast of, of California, where we see uh, slope failure events triggered by seismic activity. So these show up both visually, um, but also in uh, <laughs> In, in various parameters uh, that we can measure of the lake cores. In this case, I'm plotting sediment density of the core through these two intervals. And we can see, for the most part, that the two disturbance events line up with uh, higher than normal density. And this has to do to, to the relatively low amounts of organic material, although in this case, there's a whole lot of interstitial organic material macrofossils that, uh, that I'm suggesting were um, collected with all of this other debris and reworked and redeposited at the same time um, that this the metergenic material was deposited. Uh, so we see that in, in sediment density, 
Um, sorry, I'm going to skip ahead here. But we also see it in uh, in uh, sand concentrations. So I've had students measure the sand concentration of these of these cores. So now this is just these two events that I'm showing here. But now I'm, I'm um, on the lower panel, I'm zooming out to the entire six and a half meter thick sediment core for Jenny Lake, where we see these two events here of high density, but that there's this, this uh, thick interval where we see a, a series of these high density turbidite uh, deposits that show up um, with anomalous uh, sediment density, but also um, anomalous sand concentration. So these are for two different cores um, taken in, in uh, kind of close proximity to each other. And we can then use those chronometers, those different dating techniques, to transfer this data from a depth scale onto an age scale. And that, of course, will um, uh, condense these features because they were deposited almost instantaneously. So these black uh, triangles here are locations where we have age control of the sediments. And so in many cases, we've dated the lower and upper surfaces of these turbidite deposits, uh, and so they were deposited uh, in a single event horizon. So that's why we see this compression of those features uh, into these sharp peaks. So now we're going from, uh, we're going through time from left to right. So from about 14,000 years ago on the left side to the present, and we can see now just looking at the density of these sediments, how there's a series of these uh, disturbance events. So I just highlighted them here with these gray bars. Like, again, this is for two sediment cores uh, in Jenny Lake, so they line up really well. So we see eight major events that took place. Um, uh, with the most recent event right before the deposition of the Mount Mazama tephra layer at 7.6 thousand years ago. So that so I'm just using that for uh, reference here as our um, age control. And then we have radiocarbon um, ages of all the other uh, deposits. And that's when they occurred. So I'll let you kind of take um, a second to look at these numbers here. What you can see is that the most recent event, major event, uh, was seven and a half or 7.6 thousand years ago, which uh, is darn close to the, the age of the most recent event that they uncovered in the Granite Creek Trench, if indeed that was a single event. And so uh, there there's, has been renewed interest in trenching the Teton Fault, because that's kind of the tried and true method of developing paleo uh, seismic records of these, these normal fault systems. And so the USGS is out here with other folks. Uh, some of you may remember back in September of last year, they put a big trench in um, at the Teton Village Ski Resort. Um, and other folks have been excavating relatively small hand dug trenches. So one at the ski resort in September, that was huge. Uh, I have, the, the trench itself was huge. It must have been, oh gosh, 200 feet long and uh, maybe 20 feet or 15 to feet deep or something like that. That was excavated with a, a, a big backup. But other folks have been digging smaller trenches across the fall just with shovels and pickaxes. Uh, to try and really determine when the most recent event was. But the only existing trench data um, suggests that the most recent event was still, was well, quite a long time ago. What's the spike at about three and a half thousand? Yeah, so I was going to get to that. So these, so this is the eight largest, by far, largest events that we see in the lake segment course. And that's what I've listed here in this list of ages. There are other events though, and that's why I have some other ages um, at, at shallower depths or younger younger ages in the core that look like potentially minor events. They have similar stratigraphy to these larger events here, but they're nowhere near as big. So this is 25 centimeters thick. So this is a huge unit um, within the center of the lake. Some of these younger events don't really show up in, in the sand concentration data. They show up visually as maybe a centimeter or centimeter and a half um, uh, horizon that has similar stratigraphy and does seem to have higher density. So at the moment, I'm interpreting these as relatively minor events, perhaps slope failure events, but also, and as I'd like to kind of uh, instigate a discussion about the, 
genesis of these events. Perhaps those are, could have been formed by even smaller events along the fault or by other processes such as floods. So perhaps some of you in the room are thinking about other ways in which a, 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 an event horizon like this can be generated in the main basin. The only other real way to do that other than slope failure um, is through a flooding event. I would argue though that to develop, to, to transport these coarse sediments kilometers out into the center of the lake in water depths of 200 plus feet uh, and have this, this consistent stratigraphy and this erosive basal surface, it's unlikely that a flood event can, can generate something like that. It's, it's highly unlikely. Um, if we were closer to shore, perhaps, or in shallower water depths, maybe, but to generate um, these baseline conformities in 75 meters of water um, really requires a strong turbidite flow, which is unlikely to have happened during the flood event. But that kind of segues into the, the, the second half of this talk, I guess. So the, the most recent age in the lake, the Jenny Lake, of a major event corresponds to the existing paleo seismic data from the, the Granite Creek Trench. And then we see two ages here, and this gets to some of the, the questions in the audience that we've had uh, previously. Two of the ages of these these turbidite deposits line up to the exposure ages of the landslides that we see uh, above the fault scarps that ran out into the lake basins themselves. And that's at 8.3 thousand years ago and 13.9 thousand years ago. And so <clears throat> to get back into the map of, of Jenny Lake, to our field site here, we're looking on the left at the western shore of Jenny Lake, right at the mouth of Cascade Canyon, at these two landslide um, scarp and runout paths. And these red dots are locations where we've collected um, boulder and bedrock samples and dated those using exposure age methods. In this case, similar to the um, uh, similar to other radiometric dating techniques, we can use the concentration of these rare elements contained within the crystal lattice of minerals in these rocks uh, and determine how long they've been exposed at the surface. When we do that, we come up with average ages for 13.9, 14,000 years ago for the northern landslide, and roughly 8.3 thousand years ago for the southern landslide. And these line up uh, with the chronologies, the completely independently derived chronologies of the disturbance events from the lake setting, of course. This picture on the left is showing, is just from the, uh, the lake itself, looking at the southern landslide. Uh, so the head scarf appears in bedrock, and it runs out through that giant boulder deposit that the trail then runs through. So some of those giant boulders are what um, we were targeting for sampling. And then this is the debris, the block and fan deposit right at, it's right below in the lake itself. So <coughs> these sorts of evidence are, are why we think indeed um, we're looking at uh, slope failures triggered by earthquakes here is that not only do they line up with existing paleo seismic data, but they line up with some of these other independently dated features that we see along the fault. The primary uh, focus of ongoing work now is to replicate this study uh, in the other lake basins along the fault. And so that's what we're out here doing this past spring uh, to really corroborate what we're seeing at Jenny Lake with the idea being that um, the, the series of these turbidite event horizons uh, happening multiple lake basins at the same time being expressed in a similar way can really only be uh, explained through uh, strong ground shaking events. <clears throat> all right, so to summarize here, and then of course I'll, I welcome all questions, the geomorphology of the Tetons now attracts over 4 million visitors to Grand Teton National Park each year. So I'm sure many of you have been experiencing this, these visitors. <laughs> uh, someone was mentioning how the traffic was bad on the way here. But, so this is a highly popular area, and that is th this landform, which is drawing all these people here, is, is really due to this active tectonic setting and uplift along the fault. Previous studies suggest that these prominent faults, fault scarps that are visible along the, the entire range front were generated by a series of multiple strong earthquake events during the past 14,000 years ago, but the paleo seismic record is really incomplete. And so while the iconic scenery of the park has benefited from this tectonic activity, the potential for future large events uh, and related slope failures, of course, presents a hazard to, to all of these visitors. 
to us living here, right, to park infrastructure. We, there's, there are dams along um, the Snake River, as we saw uh, earlier, in the and to resource conservation and management efforts. And so this study, I believe, demonstrates that lake sediments within the park presented a, a kind of new and exceptional opportunity to construct a, a continuous and well-dated record of post-glacial paleoseismicity. And so ongoing work here aims to replicate some of the results that I've uh, presented to you this evening. That, I'd like to say thanks and thank you. We have, we have a few minutes for a few questions. So Darren, could you say something about what you're going to talk about tomorrow at the Senior Center, maybe real quick? Yeah, so um, that, that, because we had some questions earlier, we talked that ran over uh, a little bit, but I understand folks have to leave. Those of you who are interested, tomorrow, uh, I'll be talking more about this and getting uh, a little bit more into the, the details of the data acquisition and the methods that we are actually employing uh, to generate these results. So um, that's at the senior center at um, noon, basically. Yes. Where do you think the best place to see the fault? The best place to see the fault? That's um, really obvious that it is the fault. So Spring Lake is one of the, the uh, places where if I had to lead a field trip, I would take folks there. The, the slope right above the western shore of Spring Lake, um, you can see it from the, you know, the, the road, the North Jenny Lake road there before you get into the kind of next conifer forest. You're looking at the, the hill slope above Spring Lake and particularly in the afternoon um, when the shadows are being cast along the range front, you can see the scarp clear as day, running right along that, the entire hill slope there, which is this interlude between two um, valleys. And so you have this old hill slope that really shows the false start over a long distance. If you want to see it just offsetting one of these moraines, that, that spot by Jenny Lake isn't bad. Um, or hiking along the moraine that separates Bradley and Taggart Lakes, that one's great too, because you, you follow the path and it, you, I believe there's a path there. I know there's a yeah, the other. Yes. If you're just following that moraine with Bradley Lake to, to your right and Tiger to your left, as you walk straight into the hill slope, you, you walk straight into the scarf itself. That is the, the fall scarf right there. And you'll notice an inflection in the, the slope of the, the hill. You never do it. There's, there's actually a sign for the drive down the stream lake, there's a little pull out. And there's a sign in the picture of the fall scarf that's identified on the photo.
So most of the movement is subsidence of the valley. Yes. And then more recently, at the right of the initiation is occurring, there's more rapid, rapid uh, that's related to the initiation. Exactly. So you're saying the longer term picture, you know, that the yes. was 10,000 years ago, subsidence. And there's a small group of these. Okay. Are we? Are there plate tectonics involved in this, or is this just? Yes. We have time for one more question tonight, but a lot of questions tomorrow. So one more question. Eric, you say? What was the top highest elevation you think the Tetons ever walked? Oh, wow. What was this great question? They're still going up. You'll get different answers from different geologists. I would say they're as high right now as they probably ever been. Uh, I mean, there will be people who argue about that. And the age, best age, I mean, we were talking to Ken Pierce about this. They probably began really just about 500 years ago. There's evidence to suggest that they're that young. So they're still going up the valley more, they're still going down. There's no reason to believe they're not as high now as they've ever been. So, on behalf of the geologists of Jackson Hole, Darren, I want to give you a small token of appreciation for the incredible.